Harvard Business School. Yeah, well, in that case, Ch Charles Wilson was the intermediary. Charles had written and published the first serious company history on an academic basis series mm -hmm. in England, which was of Unilever. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this had established uh, him very powerfully as a leading figure in British business history and drawn him to the attention of the Harvard Business School who were looking for a successor to N.S.B. Grass who was a pioneer in business history there. He declined and when they asked him if he could name somebody else, possibly a young yeah. mm. scholar, he named me. Mm. And I was then approached, um, flew to uh, Cologne, I think, <laughs> for an interview with the Harvard Dean, a Dean of the school, and uh, was invited to go to Harvard Business School uh, initially as a visiting lecturer, as a sort of trial basis. And that was in 1955. And so callowly, uh, at the age of 24, I went to the Harvard Business School, where the average age of the students was about 28 or 30. <laughs> uh, and it's the first time I'd been to America, almost the first time other than to France that I'd been out of the country, mm. out of this country. Um, and that was in October, uh, September 55. Yeah. Mm. Uh, having uh, ta uh, been examined for my PhD mm. by Jack Fisher and William Poston. And if I can tell one anecdote yeah, about that, Jack, mm. Jack Fisher said to me partway through the uh, oral, uh, I noticed that you um, haven't mentioned the Council of the North as one of the sources of your information. Why is that? And I said, well, you know, I'd, I had enough material from the public record. I fudged it, mm. public, Privy Council. Oh, he said, taking his pipe out of his mouth, it wasn't because all the records were burnt in the 19th century. <laughs> it was a very Jack Fisherish thing. Anyway, <laughs> they nevertheless gave me the PhD. Mm. What about, uh, we didn't talk about Poston, was it? Uh, well, Poston, Poston was, uh, was a sort of influence. I saw him mm. from time to time. I didn't, mm. I mean, like, like a lot of research students, mm. I had a, 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 an individual life, mm. a soul life. I used to go to a seminar regularly. Mm. And uh, he, we knew each other. And when I submitted an article uh, for publication, he, he was neither then or later, he, he, he said to me, ah, oh, yes, well, you, uh, it, it's good, but you ought to study somebody else's style. I won't name the other person, mm -hmm. the person whose style I didn't much admire. <laughs> <laughs> he said, but no, Poston was quite helpful. It was, but it was only in later years when I came mm. back as his, one of his successors that mm. he, we got to know each other, mm. really. He was a formidable... Man, he? he was a formidable man. Uh, he, I, I, I didn't go to many lectures when mm. I was a research student, but I did go to a couple of his. And yes, he, he's, he was an extraordinary man. Do you want to hear about? Mm. <laughs> yes, I do. Because he did combine a sort of flamboyant neglect of some things, mm. even academic things, with profound perceptive insights mm. into things. I mean, he's a man of great ideas. A bit like. Jack Fisher, in a funny mm. way, he'd cut mm. to a problem and mm. do it. On the other hand, the anecdote which I always savour because it's so much of, of Poston, he's giving a lecture in America and saying there was no shortage of capital in Cyrus, Russia, and the evidence for that is that the rate of interest was only 4%, you know, there was no shortage of capital. At which point, David Landers, who mm. subsequently went on to great fame, was then a, a young scholar, said, Professor Poston, that seems perfect. That seems very low. And Poston says, "What? Seven, eight, nine percent is low." <laughs> 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 so he would. He made up things less often than he found them out. But he <laughs> he was a he was a, a, a very good and interesting scholar. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And he cared about things. So mm. Yes, he was passionate. And and this combination of being a very good medievalist and a very good modernist. Yes. It's quite unusual. It's unique, I think. Mm. Well, I Trevor Rupert to a certain extent. Yes, was. that's true. But in my in economic history, it was, mm. it's very rare indeed. And it, uh, but it was a remarkable one because he established powerful reputations, I mean, in, in the real world, I should mm. say, as well as academic world in this, because, you know, mm. he was very friendly with Hugh Gates School and mm. um, gave advice. Mm. Uh, did it, uh, I may have got it wrong. Did he marry Eileen Power? 
or uh, he he did yes he, he did he was widowed you know yes there was a most extraordinary uh, pairing as mm. his subsequent marriage was mm. as well yes he did he did marry Arthur. did you know her at all? no I never mm. met her mm. no. she was a no. interesting lady um, okay well you stayed in America for how long I was in America for five years mm. the, initially I mean after a bit after the excitement unhappily feeling I ought to come back because I was lonely and I missed Cambridge and I missed this and the other. And by the time, and, and, and declined an opportunity, which I kicked myself for even now, of getting an, I had a, I had a temporary visa, mm. a work permit, but a temporary visa, and declined the opportunity, it was called an exchange visitors mm. visa, uh, declined the opportunity of getting an immigrant visa because I was going on holiday and I mm. knew I didn't want to stay, at least mm. I thought I didn't want to stay. And by the time I'd come round, uh, it was too late because the law had changed. And if you were on exchange visa the visa, you had to leave the country for two years mm. before you could go back. The Americans introduced it in order mm. to protect uh, the, the schemes that had brought over people mm. from less developed countries to uh, on exchange visa visas to uh, to study, mm. and then stayed on and didn't go mm. back with all their new skills to wherever mm. it was. Um, I had married by that time and had a child or two who were American and my well, wife... I'm not a vague about how many children you had. Well, I forget the exact timing oh, at which I... <laughs> no, no, I know, I know exactly how many children I had. <laughs> but by the time I, you know, had to uh, shape up to I this. I see, yes. Um, and uh, I was there for five years and at mm. some point I had to leave mm. because the law had changed as much as I wanted to stay. So I did the next best thing and went to Canada for mm. two years to McGill. I mean, I took a job mm. and it was at Canada, mm. it was in Canada, and it happened that it lasted mm. two years, thinking that those two years would enable me to come back. Mm. And at that stage, the, at the end of the two years, when I was qualified to get an mm. American visa, um, I discovered, which I think is, is, is the truth, which is that you can decide all you want about countries but in the end it's also the institution that attracts you mm. and there was nothing in on the horizon in American academia mm. that, that attracted me, except the possibility of a job at MIT which I would have taken had they been impressed mm. more impressed by me than they were uh, to replace uh, Walt Rostow who then mm. moved off to the Kennedy administration and whereas Sussex had just mm. started so Sussex as against Oshkosh or whatever in the States mm. seemed a much more and um, Asa Briggs, whom I knew very well by that time, was very uh, uh, persuasive mm. about this. It was in the early first year of Sussex. So we came back to, uh, to England. So I was five years in the States, two years in Canada at McGill. And I suppose I, I, I could have easily stayed, and it was in a way very attractive. But I found Canada, for me, uh, an unsatisfactory uh, compromise between uh, America and Britain. More, more parochial and less exciting than, mm. than I wanted it to be. Although it was very good, I mm. wouldn't want to criticise it. So you went back to Sussex. That, that perhaps explained something. I noticed you're an honorary fellow of my old college at Oxford, Worcester. And I was wondering why you were, because you weren't at Worcester, presumably um, mm. at Oxford. But was it through Asa Briggs? No, it no, it was, it was through um, St. Catherine's, because we're sister colleges, mm -hmm. although it doesn't mean very much now. I see. But there, there, are, there used to be exchanges mm. at, at, at din and dinners. Amicabilis Concordia, or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so, so I would get I see. For, yeah. mm. So you went back to Sussex. Um, and it was pretty, it was quite new, wasn't it, at that? Yes, uh, it had, they'd always intended the university to start in October 62, which is when I went there. Uh, but in the event, it was at, because of pressure of students mm. wanting to go to university in expansion, mm. it was actually opened on a, on a, on a shoestring mm. in 61, but mm. not on the site which it now occupies, but in a house in Brighton and Asa Briggs and I think seven other mm. academics, not me. Mm. And then in 62, it opened on the main mm. site in porter cabins and mm. with one building, and that's when I, I went mm. back, yeah. That, mm. that was a, very exciting. Yeah, tell university. me about being as an opening of a new university of that period. It was an exciting... It was very exciting because one was actually creating things. I remember years later Asa saying that one of his regrets was he didn't keep a diary because it's such mm. a rare event in history mm. to be mm. at the present university. 
Um, it was very exciting because one was both constructing a curriculum, mm. uh, recruiting people, and organising a structure, I mean, mm. a governance structure. Mm. Uh, and um, although I wasn't all that senior, I was moderately senior, and I became secretary of the School of Social Sciences, where ASA was dean, mm. and so mm. as well as pre vice chancellor. So I was pretty much near the levers of, uh, of influence and power anyway. Uh, and that was very dramatic, yeah, devising mm. not only new courses, but courses that were new, I mean, that mm. hadn't mm. been taught before, like Contemporary Britain or mm. Modern European Mind or mm. whatever. Um, and, and I, in fact, ended, ended up, I stayed there for 16 years, mm. in one way or another. Um, every time I thought of leaving something else, which I'll talk about in a minute, something else intervened. So I, I went there in 60, 62, although I have to say that in the August of 62, just before I started, the University of Michigan uh, invited me to go and talk mm. with them about possibilities, and I went, mm. and, and it was, I was very impressed. But that, at that stage, I was very much missing. I, mean, I, was, I had always regretted not staying in America, mm. but I was mm. then missing it and sort of accepted the post and came back and then realized that uh, uh, my wife and certainly two now raising three children he, the third one was born in the september uh, back in the arms of my wife's family and i back in the arms of mine uh, deeply embedded that it would have seen both feckless and, and worrying to to jump back even before i started at sussex because the term hadn't started yet for which i'd come back so I changed my mind, not for the first or the last time, mm. as you'll see when you come to read mm. the autobiography, uh, and uh, didn't go to Michigan. Mm. Uh, stayed at Sussex very happily, um, but uh, exactly the same sort of thing happened in '64 when I was invited back to Harvard to be a visiting professor mm. and give some lectures while Gershwin Crown came to mm. England. Uh, I introduced him to Jack Fisher, and I understand mm. the two sort of warily circled <laughs> each other like beasts of the jungle, mm. but I told him to get in touch with Jack. Uh, and, uh, and that was very exciting, and I was uh, strongly tempted to stay there. But uh, Asa Briggs, who was no fool, trumped it by getting me a promotion even before I'd come back. <laughs> I think to read her at that stage, mm. you know. And again, I had got... Oh, no, 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 that's, that's a more interesting story. In '64, I'd got a contingent immigrant visa to mm. the States, even though I was only going for three months. Mm. And my wife had got one. The two of the children were already mm. American citizens because by mm. birth, the third one, uh, we put on one of the other children's passports. And I was offered a job at Berkeley mm. and was very impressed with what I saw. I went there and uh, was hosted there by a man called. Um, Henry Rozovsky, you may mm. probably haven't come across him. Rozovsky. Rozovsky, yes. Yeah. No, no, Modern no. historian, he yeah. subsequently became dean at Harvard. Uh, and sort was on the point of accepting because, you know, it was tropical paradise. Mm. Uh, and then Henry phoned me one day and said, I can't advise you to come here anymore. Uh, I'm leaving. David Landers, who was there, is leaving. Um, there's turmoil because it was the beginning of mm. the student rebellion, the sort of mm. free speech movement. 66-ish. Right. 64. Yeah, before it became violent, but mm. it was it was very... De uh, unrest was mm. rampant. It was uh, uh, Savio, mm. I forget the man's mm. first name, he was the, the first student mm. leader. And there was a free speech movement. They wanted mm. to meet in some way. And he said, Henry said, which was very uh, uh, indicative, he said it's getting like the University of Saigon. <laughs> and that put me off, obviously. Mm. And so I didn't and couldn't and didn't want to go to Brandeis, which was another mm. alternative. So slightly with my tail between my legs, mm. came back to Britain, to England. Like Henry, who was going to Harvard for a quiet mm. life, thinking I would have a quiet life. And Henry at Harvard and I, somewhat mm. later at Sussex, did not have a quiet <laughs> life in terms of the student mm. Uh, mm. unrest. So that was another occasion mm. when I came back to England. In what was it about America that attracted you so much, I mean, uh, either at the academic level or the yeah. cultural level? Well, I've often asked myself that in, in, in empirical detail. Um, not the most important thing, but to get it off the thing, I, I am a bit of a materialist, mm. and I enjoy 
the material side mm. of American life. Mm. I enjoy the the things that go with it, the sort of openness of the possibilities, mm. not only of acquiring things but using things mm. in interlocking. I think I enjoyed, I appreciated uh, American university openness, the, mm. the social, uh, the relaxed nature, American humour. Mm. Um, the the, the 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 potential for for possibilities in that mm. sort of society, which I mean, no doubt I'm wrong, but I mean mm. that's what I felt that things were, you could break out of things that the, the world was your oyster, mm. that that things are possible, um, and I found it very and still do find it uh, very relaxing, uh, and uninhibited, really, so that I've always felt myself as a sort of uh, pseudo American. Mm. And over the years, I used to think here that, uh, well, I'm here, it's lovely, and I'm enjoying it, and you know, when I retire, I'll get a retirement job in America or mm. something like this. Mm. Uh, but of course, the, the more time passed, the more both by institutional commitment and by personal life, one was embedded mm. in, uh, in English society, which is good. Um, and so it, it sort of faded away. Mm. And even when my first wife uh, died at us and I got remarried and remarried and married an American mm. and there was a, a choice then I was retired by then from here although I was doing post-retirement work for a foundation uh, there was a, a question as to where we might live mm. and uh, again I resisted that partly now because my grown-up children and their children mm. were all in England mm. it seemed a slightly again feckless thing to do mm. uh, so I didn't what I should have done was to buy a flat there and kept a flat here, mm. instead of which I put down roots here with my new wife. Mm. So, those are the, those are some of the things that attract mm. to me, and I've always been interested both in in American politics, American literature, mm. and learning about it. I mean, the New York Times figures more prominently than the than the mm. London Times in, the, mm. in my email uh, uh, connections here, uh, and I've been back very frequently. Mm. Really, I've just come back from a long trip. Uh, and if I had my time over again, I would, I would stay. I would have stayed. I mean, I would have stayed in America. Yeah, I would have gone to mm. America without doubt. But of course, well, incidentally, once my children had grown up, mm. it, it was, it was too late really to mm. become an American because they were mm. English. I mean, they mm. meant leaving them or culturally leaving them. Mm. Whereas, had we stayed in America, mm. I'm sure there would have been periods in which I would have deeply regretted staying. They mm. would have taken to drugs or the, mm. the turmoil of American mm. society. I mean, the, the, one of the attractions of America, Alan, is that, this, that there are times where you, you despair of the society, you know, it's, mm. it's politics, awful, you know, things mm. happen, and particularly in the Vietnam War and mm. what happened in the universities, but it comes through, mm. it survives, and then it, it somehow reinvents itself and it's something like it used mm. to be. And uh, I remember thinking that in 1976 when they were celebrating mm. uh, the centenary, mm. the bicentenary, uh, that they'd, they'd come through the turmoil of the Vietnam War. I mean, Vietnam War still existed and they, mm. they've done worse things since. But uh, it's a society of perpetual possibility, I suppose. Is, what I mean. is it perpetually a society of perpetual possibility? <laughs> it's perpetually, a, yes. It you never think because uh, Tocqueville, of course, praised it for that, for being a young country which could recover from its yes. failures. Yeah. Um, and that's what we all continue to hope it will do. But Absolutely. countries grow old and they come to a point where it's less easy to recover from your... You do. Yes, they do. I despair of what's going on at the moment, but I do remember despairing earlier. <laughs> I, it's interesting you mentioned the top wheel because I recall that in the um, spring of 1960, when uh, I knew I had to leave America and Canada had appeared on the horizon and McGill as mm. a possibility. Before flying to McGill for my interview, I read to Tocqueville, for some reason mm. I had it, mm. and realised what I was sort of leaving as well. Yeah. But I knew I had to leave at that mm. stage. Um, and I still have a, a, a mental image, a great memory, of driving with my U-Haul trailer behind, trailer behind me mm. and, and the young family with us up to uh, Montreal and hearing the, um, uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic being sung by the Mormon choir on the, on the car radio and thinking, oh, this is, 
<laughs> I mean, these are all movie images, mm. but they, they, they're mm. whatever mm. Evelyn Waugh said about popular music is very true. That it's a very powerful instrument, and mm. this is more than popular music. Anyway, that's mm. that's, that's, oh, that's that, yeah. interesting. Returning to Sussex just very briefly, yes. you mentioned um, you were quite involved as secretary of the um, school and so on. I mean, and you earlier mentioned your interest in bureaucracy and your esteem of bureaucracy. Mm. Um, so this fitted quite well with your interest in shaping the institution. Oh yes, because I went on to succeed Asa first as the dean of the school, mm. and then uh, as what was then called chairman of the arts deans. Which, but mm. the arts deans were transmuted when there was a devolution mm. of the university, and I became pro vice chancellor for that half of the university, which was arts and. Mm. Uh, social studies mm. uh, so yeah I was very much embedded in the bureaucracy of, uh, of Sussex yes. mm. I mean, you seem to enjoy it I mean many academics uh, Ernest Gellner's theory was that academics when they no longer had anything useful to say to the world became administrators yeah. but mm. some uh, certainly a lot of people I've met have been both extremely good academics and good administrators and some clearly just love well, they don't love, but they you know, yeah. find it quite interesting. Yes. I found it interesting. I felt it was possible to combine. I mean, I could have done much more academic work had I not been an administrator, mm. but I found it possible to combine some. Uh, I remember a long conversation I actually had with Noel Annan, who came mm. down to mm. talk about what, 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 what it was like and what hierarchies mm. are like universities. When, I think when he'd just gone to University College, mm. London. Uh, and... Uh, well, I, I, bear it. I think it is true that there are some academics who uh, retreat into administration mm. because they're but either burned out or had nothing mm. to burn out to begin <laughs> with. Uh, but there are others, you know, who affect uh, uh, to despise uh, mm. administration, uh, but who don't necessarily achieve very much anyway. Mm. But who, mm. so, Or who, uh, I mean, the image I always had is people who say, I don't understand all this mm. paper. Mm. Which you know, if you if you're already a professor, you should understand mm. all the paper, even mm. if you don't do the work. Mm. You know? but mm. There was an is an affectation on both sides, mm. I think. Mm. Uh, but certainly, um, like a lot of, I mean, one of the books, one of the articles I never write is why economic historians have become such utility players in the world of academic administration. If you think, if you tick them off on your fingers, there you are know, a lot of them. And I mean, Peter Mathias here mm. and Beric Saul, who was mm. from Liverpool, I think. Lots, lots of My, uh, Michael Martin Daunton. Mm. Uh, it, it's a very common thing. I think it's partly the rec the, rec the it's smoke and mirrors. Mm. The humanities people think they're social, they're, they're social scientists, and social scientists mm. think the humanities. Everybody thinks they understand mm. more than they do. You know? mm. Anyway, yeah, sorry, I interrupted that. But you, but you quite, and you obviously um, organise your time rather efficiently to fit in. Can can you tell tell me about your day? when you were you know, in the middle of this, either then or later, slightly later, I mean, how, how do you organise your time? Yes. Well, I suppose I'm a, I'm a list man who draws up the list in order to get things out of his head rather than mm. order to do things in an orderly way. <laughs> I, I do that. Uh, I, I tend to react to issues or problems that arise, let's say administratively, uh, shooting from the hip, I mean, the thing mm. itself. I, I'm not a good time organiser. Um, I suppose I'm a fairly hard worker in that I would mm. stay up late to, to do the things. Uh, but thinking back, I'm not sure I have had a great system. I think I neglected academic potential. I could have written more. I mean, my output mm. hasn't been huge mm. anyway. Um, and I've been fortunate in the two or three things I've done have you know, had some prominence, but. I could. I think they could have been could have been much much more and mm. much more profound, if I'd wanted them to. Mm. But I, I allowed myself to do these other things as well. Um, on the other hand, I didn't. I, I didn't lose a lot of sleep over administrative issues, mm. and I always did have the feeling that uh, a lot of the issues that were brought to me, certainly when I was at college, uh, by fellows at the college, were issues that just wanted to talk about. I mean, they weren't mm. issues that that involved administrative effort mm. Mm. later on. People have problems that are not are insoluble, I mean, mm. but, they, but what they need is to talk about them, mm. and that I was happy to do. And I think I was probably quite a good chairman, so mm. that I didn't waste a lot of time mm. with the meetings, mm. um, both the college meetings and the college's committee the, of, of heads of houses. Um, 
quite know. I, I didn't. I do take administration seriously. I was about to say I don't mm. take it seriously. <laughs> I, I don't let it occupy my entire mm. life. You know. It doesn't seep out of the no. um, the administrative framework into your dreams and, and no. uh, holidays. And, no, not yeah. really. No. Right. no. In fact, when I was on holiday, the the conceit I allowed myself was always to, uh, as it still is, is to write a postcard to the vice chancellor saying whoever he or she was. <laughs> We're thinking of you. It's all right. Jane. You're <laughs> thought of even by people on holiday. <laughs> uh, so I managed to combine them, but I think in a disproportionate way. I, don't, I wouldn't like to claim that I was mm. both a well-established scholar and a, and a successful administrator. T- taking the, the other side, the uh, academic work. Um, how how do you work there? I'm always interested. I mean, do you work in the mornings? Do you work in the evenings? Do you have your great thoughts in the bath or on walks? Yes. Do you listen to music? What? What? Uh, I sit at a desk. I don't listen to music. I can't work mm. while listening. I can't work while listening to music. I sort mm. papers. Well. Can't work. That. And I don't, on the whole, do academic work in the evening. I didn't. I'm silly using mm. the present tense. I didn't mm. do academic <laughs> work in the evenings. Uh, but yeah, day by day and weekends. I mean, I mm. think that on the whole, in one sense, I might have been verge on being a neglectful father or family man mm-hmm. in that I would work through the weekends mm-hmm. and things. So I would tackle things, so that, but I think by writing, I think is the answer mm-hmm. to what you're getting at. I mean, mm-hmm. I have my thoughts by trying to write them mm-hmm. down mm-hmm. and seeing them evolve and seeing parallels mm-hmm. as, I, as I write. Uh, and wanting always to start writing before I'm ready. You know, in mm-hmm. a way. And well, now, I mean, when I was a great research student, I did all the inductive work first. Mm. And, mm. I mean, Geoffrey Otten would have been proud of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm. But I don't, I don't think I have a particular style of... of mm. uh, didn't have a particular style of doing these things. And um, I'm sad that over the last 17 years, I haven't really been very productive since I left Cambridge. Mm. Do I mean, were there situations which led you to have, uh, as they are rather cliched, the eureka moments. I mean, in other words, do you remember occasions when something happened, you went to listen to a, watch a film or something, and then you suddenly thought, ah, oh, that, that's the cause of the Civil War or whatever? <laughs> yes. yes. Or Not many. There was one which was more of parallelism, although I always think it's an interesting parallelism. Um, in the late 60s, when Asa became... Uh, uh, Vice Chancellor of Sussex, and I became Pro Vice Chancellor. Uh, we uh, pioneered the use of a management consultancy firm to come and investigate us. It was McKinsey's. Mm. I remember Jack Fisher saying to me, "Very," he said, "What will happen is they will come, and they will say essentially they will say to you, are you uh, centralised or decentralised? And whatever you say, they'll tell you to do the opposite." <laughs> which is exactly what happened. <laughs> they came and said, you're too centralised. That's how I became mm. Provost Chancellor Arts. Now, that established a, a structure of, of um, decentralised or uh, institu- sub-institutions within the bigger mm. institutions. And at that time, I was writing the history of the Royal Exchange Assurance mm. and the insurance industry. Mm. And I think I saw this there. Mm. I mean, obviously, you make up these things. Mm. They're, they're, they're devices. So I wrote a, a history which was had a lot in it about delegation mm. and decentralization and the subordinate mm. institutions, mm. much as the parallel university mm. was doing. Mm. I suppose that's the nearest I've got to a sort of seeing an, out, an idea from the outside rather mm. than building up something mm. from, the, from the inside. Mm. The other thing, which wasn't a eureka moment, but uh, was, was I was writing the history of the coal industry at the time of the great coal strike in 84-5. Mm. Mm. So there were sort of echo effects, because mm. I'm doing work on the 20th century coal industry. Mm. So there were echo effects that I was mm. able to bring over and go back. And I remember the, the then warden of Nuffield saying, what do you think of it? And I said, well, the point at which the bishops intervene is the point at which the strike will end. You know, and that's will sort of, end? Will end, yeah. Well, it brings it <laughs> bring on the bishops. <laughs> bring on the bishops, yeah. <laughs> anyway, but other than that, no great right. eureka moments. No. What about methods? I mean, you, as you say, a lot of your work is quite based on facts, as they used to call them, mm. uh, inductive and so on. Um, do you have condexing systems and filing systems or 
computer filing system? I, I, I don't know. I, I did. When I was a graduate student, I was a, a pioneer of methodology. I had Coke Chat files. Coke Chat cards. I used to have those too. Yes. Um, <laughs> Well, since I'm old, you had little holes. In that's the right, and you clip the top. Mm, yeah, that's and uh, that's how I had all my notes, and it was brilliant because I mm. put the knitting needle through and lifted them up, and mm. and uh, was able to write from that, which I did. But I've lost the code. I thought you were going to say you lost the needle. <laughs> no, no, the needles I can find. I lost the code. So I, I have all these somewhere in the attic, but the hope. I mean, they're useless because <laughs> I, I don't know which holes to push the bloody needle through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, that was the system I had then. Subsequently, lots and lots of notes on mm. A4. Mm. Uh, the the thing that I uh, found was a, a a disadvantage as well as a blessing was the use of research assistants. I had, when I wrote the Royal Exchange, I had a research assistant the whole time, and and he produced much too much for me to absorb. Mm. You know, you spend all your time reading what they write and mm. talking about it and doing very little thinking mm. yourself. Mm. So. Unlike Les, do you know Les Hammer? I mean, he's, yeah, you know, he, he used to just get people to write in position papers and then. Sort of, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it was useful when you're doing a very mm. big history, but mm. uh, it could be could be disadvantageous. Mm. And the other thing is to have too many resources. When I wrote the coal industry, I had unlimited typing aid at the mm. um, at the National Coal Board, mm. so I used to take a tape recorder into the. Uh, public record office mm. and dictate and dictate it in they would type it up and all I did was transfer this huge part of material mm. from the public record office to my desk mm. <laughs> I hadn't done anything with it there you know, mm. was no absorption no no that's one of the problems um, perhaps just to finish on that well not to finish but can mm. pursue that just a little if, if uh, someone said um, a- academically intellectually what of your academic work do you think you would like to select for your desert island for, or for other people on their desert islands what, what do you think are your most interesting important influential ideas one or two of them that mm. and um, explain what they are to the world out there which yes. is waiting yes Alan do you mean the particular empirical things or the the, the approach the nature of the ideas you know, like. yes well I suppose the original the original work on the early uh, 17th century in the sense of seeing a relationship between economic thinking, economic thought, mm. and empirical event and events, mm. uh, and therefore a sensitivity to the symbiosis between the way people think about problems mm. and the problems that arise. I mean, the mm. balance of payments thing was an mm. example of that. And also the, the incidence of the fluctuations in Britain's cloth trade mm. and the reactions of the government, the reactions of early economists to it. That's that's one mm. approach. And I and I did I did a fair amount of that in a quite different way later on when I got interested in nine, in twentieth century uh, in di- economic policy and the the concept of of decline and mm. the interaction between how governments responded. Uh, and and thinkers like Keynes responded to events mm. to the course of development or lack of it in the 20s and 30s and the actual events themselves so I, I did write a, a, a fair amount on that on, mm. on economic thinking and policy it's really on political economy I suppose mm. and, and that is the title I use for the coal industry as well mm. and in that sense although I don't think that people use it as much as I had hoped the coal industry book was uh, uh, did say some useful things, but I think it's the insurance industry mm. one that, that uh, I suppose made the most original contribution to a field that had been uh, sidelined or neglected or whatever. I mean, had not been written about much, and mm. taking that industry seriously as a sort of emblem of middle class development in in England. And mm. that, actually, that got now. Asking the question, you're asking questions reminds me of things I've done that I've forgotten about because it got me interested in the concept of thrift and mm. government regulation of thrift, which I wrote a big article mm. on uh, in the 19th century. Mm. Uh, building societies and savings banks and things like that. And again, it had a sort of uh, the, the nature of the problem housing savings on the one hand and how you think about them and legislate for them on the other and, and the social implications. So it's that sort of mm. thing, I suppose. 
Yes, you're right. I was wondering to what extent the, the climate of the time influenced this, because it seems to be the time when there's all this discussion about the decline of British the British economy. Oh, certainly the decline, that was a very strong influence, because in fact I got interested in the topic of decline, on which I um, had my presidential address mm. to the Economic mm. History Society, and then it was a, my fish mm. was about mm. that. Um, I got interested in it precisely because I had, I was reviewing whinging books about, mm. yeah, <laughs> about decline and seeing what was being said in the papers mm. and everything. And I, I really took a sort of counter-intuitive view, I suppose, mm. and perhaps obstinately uh, wanted to find reasons why this was an exaggerated or mm. a misplaced view. So I wrote a fair amount about, uh, you know, what is decline? Mm. And why do you call it decline? Mm. Uh, if, if somebody from the, from the 18th century had come and visited England, he'd say, decline? What mm. decline? That sort of thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the obvious of decline is rise. I mean, have you been at all interested in the rise of, well, particularly Asian societies? I spend time in China. N not recently. When I was in America, which was when this thing was just started, I did, because I used to go to a, a seminar which re regularly, I was interested in economic development mm. and theories of development. Because you, you were with Gershon Krohn. Gershon Krohn, that's mm. right, yeah. yeah. So that concept of mm. 19th century growth and mm. what explained it and why backward mm. countries had an advantage mm. and mm. things of that sort, which I've written a little mm. bit on. Um, yeah, that was that was strong. But more recently, not the, mm. the Asian giants, mm. no, except to lose money in the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my college benefited greatly from it in the in the seventies before I got there because they and then you lost it all. They lost it all back. Uh, <laughs> Kent Beryl came here. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's move on um, to uh, there are so many other things in your career. After Sussex, you went to Oxford, did you? Or uh, yes, mm. uh, I was eager to leave Sussex. I'd been mm. there a long time, mm. which is reason enough. Sixteen years. It had been unhappy in some years because of the student unrest and because of what I took to be mm. Asa Briggs. Um, toleration mm. of a lot of it, and but to do him justice, I probably would have behaved the same mm. way if I had, mm. if I was there with the levers of power. But anyway, so I wanted to go, and then I had an extraordinary incident incident here, which I have written about, but I don't know mm. whether you want to hear it. Yes, where because I I applied for the chair of economic history when Donald David. Coleman left. Mm. Oh yes, in whenever that was seventy one. When David Jocelyn. Mm -hmm. Uh, when David Justin died, sorry, when David mm. Justin died, that's mm. right. Um, no, it was the other way. David Justin died and, and, and Coleman came, didn't he? Yes, something And like then that. Coleman yeah. retired and mm. I thought I'd apply for it, thinking how much my father would uh, appreciate mm. this. Uh, he, was, he was still alive then. And uh, I got cold feet uh, the day before, two days before, the election. Cold feet, not because I didn't think I was up to it, but mm. because my family was well embedded. We'd we'd been instrumental in in uh, transforming the education system in Sussex into a uh, into a comprehensive system, which we much favoured. I came up to Cambridge to to scout out things, and all the middle class mm. academics I talked with did nothing but talk about grammar schools and their mm. anxieties and things like mm. that. Housing was expensive. My wife mm. was well. You know, it suddenly seemed a very selfish thing to mm. do. So I drafted a letter uh, withdrawing from the competition, and was still undecided. I drafted in order mm. to see what I felt like, and went down to Brighton Station with a man called Larry Lerner, who's an mm. English literature to meet somebody. He said, oh, you've got a letter in your hand, I'll post it for you. And before I knew what I was doing, it was in the post box. <laughs> and that morn the morning, the two days later, which is the day of the election, mm. I got a telephone call from the Vice-Chancellor mm. saying, you've withdrawn, are you sure you want to? And self-respect and uh, esteem and, mm. uh, you know, desire not to be humiliated mm. led me to say no I'm afraid uh, I do mm. have to insist mm. so that wasn't to be that was 71 mm. and from that day until uh, 78 mm. uh, hardly a day passed without my saying mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
anyway, and then in 78, the readership in recent social and economic history at Oxford came vacant, mm. and without hesitation, I applied for it. So you were at Sussex for seven years, feeling you'd rather have been somewhere else? Really. Yeah, yeah, intermittently, I'd say, mm. maybe not day, yeah. but I mean, intermittently, yeah. I yeah. mean, there were moments of great happiness, and I learned to play mm. tennis, and I don't know, all this sort of thing. Mm. But yeah, I felt mm. that it was not the place I had wanted to be, ideally. Mm. Um, and uh, and uh, then Oxford mm. and Asa Briggs left. He came to mm. he went to Worcester. Yes. Uh, I became the vice pro vice chancellor, mm. which was sort of tedious. And uh, and then Ox- Oxford came along, mm. but alas, my father had died by then, mm. so it was too late. Mm. Yeah. And how was Oxford? Oxford is very good. Mm. Nuffield is a, is a brilliant place to be. Mm. No, no undergraduates. <laughs> uh, quite wealthy, small place, like a social science research. Yeah. Well, you know, mm. a social science research institute. Very helpful, nice mm. colleague, good colleagues. Um, we lived in a very nice house in North Oxford. Um, the library. Where, facility, where, which road were you in? Summertown. We were in mm. um, Middle Way. Middle Way. We've between the Banbury Road and mm. uh, whatever the other one's called. Mm. Yes. Uh, and it, it was it was Summertown. It was the mm. place. The, the it was a villa that had been built in the eighteen sixties to house the. I went to school there. I went. To yeah, that's, there, that's right. <laughs> uh, so that was all mm. very nice, and I could have happily have spent the rest of my career there. And then mm. the Cambridge chair fell due again. Mm. Sorry, I've got it all wrong. You're right. It was Jocelyn mm-hmm. Coleman got it, mm. and then retired early, mm. and that was when mm. in seventy eight uh, I said. Do I, I started to crack my knuckles mm. again. Mm. <laughs> I really want to go there. Mm. I'm not, do I, I knew I wanted to go there, but why mm. should I up, mm. have another upheaval? Mm. And in the end, I, I mean, I talked with people, um, Chelly Halsey, mm. who was very helpful. He was and at I, Nuffield, wasn't he? Yeah, he was at Nuffield, yeah. yeah. And, and Ro- Robin Matthew, I came and stayed with Robin at Clare, mm. and in the end thought, you mm. know, really. I said to, this to be interesting for your listeners as well as being in the book, because I said, to, I had a thought experiment. Mm. I said to myself, supposing you're on your deathbed and somebody mm. comes to you and said, you mean you had the opportunity <laughs> of going to the chair at Cambridge and mm. you refused to take it? Mm. I knew. No, no competition. Mm. So I applied and, and, and I got it. You were a reader at Oxford, were you, at that time? Or? Yes, yeah. yes. But, a, but I was a professorial fellow of Nuffield. I mean, yeah. it was no difference. I got the... Nuffield um, treats its fellows very generously. Mm-hmm. They, they gave me an allowance, gave everybody an allowance, which brought them up to professorial oh, level of salary. The position was the same. So what's big about coming to Cambridge then? Well, a number of reasons. One is I had a feeling that the university at which you were a student in my case, either LSE or Cambridge, is a sort of echt university. Mm. Everybody, mm. everything else is a slightly inferior mm. substitute. Mm. So that was one thing, simply the draw of being it. Secondly, uh, the feeling that it was a, a better place for economic history, not mm. a better, I mean, it was a more mm. interesting place for economic mm. history because mm. of its own tradition and the people who have been here. Uh, and thirdly, I think I wanted to be a little bit more in a traditional setting. And Nuffield was mm. a lovely place and mm. it isn't a traditional college and I felt I ought to savour savour that and finally there was the deathbed uh, argument mm. <laughs> better to have been the professor mm. of economic history in Cambridge than the reader in recent social economic history at Oxford mm. you know, in esteem I suppose um, it just seemed a more appropriate thing and I suppose I was thinking of my father mm. <laughs> really what he would have said because he was so pleased when I came here as a, mm. as a uh, graduate student Mm. Well, he wouldn't have had much preference of um, Cambridge over Oxford, presumably, but it was just the professor. Um. Yeah, I, you're, I thought about that. It's certainly the professor. I think he might have thought of Cambridge somehow, um, but I don't know why. Perhaps because I'd been there originally. Mm. I, mean, he was very, he w- I remember him saying when I came how proud he was that, that Jack Plum had asked me to do some teaching. Mm. I said, I suppose that's the way in which you encourage young, mm. young academics. Yeah. When you came, this is late 70s, early It was 80s. 70, it was 81. 81. Yeah. Mm. I was only two or three years in, in Oxford. I mean, it's not the peak period, but it's a high point, highish point in the uh, Cambridge group for the uh, study of population social yeah. structure. Uh, and Tony Wrigley, of course, overlaps with your interest a good deal and Peter yes. Laslett and 
so on. Did you have much dealing with Peter? And a little bit, not very much, because uh, as, as you say in the classics, it isn't my period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I had come across Peter uh, a, a bit. We, I became quite friendly with him. We, mm. My wife and I both did. But before that, I'd been chairman of the Economic and Social History Committee of the, of the then mm. SSRC. Mm. And we came up on a visitation once, mm. and I remember asking him a, a rather inappropriate question about how much teaching they actually do or something and he stormed out of the room because he thought it was well it wasn't the teaching it was the feeling that I was pressing them on irrelevant mm. issues to mm. the main function of the group mm. which was to uh, mm. find out new things which they did so uh, so I met yes I knew Tony mm. of course mm. and uh, Richard Smith and one or two others but I didn't have much to do with the group intellectually uh, mm. intellectually no, no. Mm. it wasn't it wasn't my bag or whatever I mean, mm. it wasn't something I was working on, because I'd long since ceased to be an early modernist anyway, mm. um, although that isn't all although that they Tony, do. Although Tony is a sort of industrial revolution. He is industrial mm. revolution, yes, yes, yes. Mm. But I'd been, by that time I was working on the 20th century coal industry, so I was mm. very much... He's a coal industry man. <laughs> that's true, in, in another, another time. Mm. Uh, and uh, so I was having an interest in modern, and, and mm. in American, mm. uh, American history, American mm. history. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they were exciting. I can't. I I, uh, I remember feeling the differences between them, between the two institutions. Mm. That when I went to Oxford, and asked the then secretary of the faculty what he thought I should lecture on, what what he would mm. like me to lecture on, to which the answer was, "Oh, my dear chap, it's entirely up to you. Please, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, because I did divine that at Oxford mm. you don't tell people what to do because then mm. they don't tell you what to mm. do. But when I got to Cambridge, it was mm. you know." There was a slot for me, mm. which is fine. I was a curriculum, and that had to be covered, and mm. that was everything. It was much more meaningful. And of course, the faculty is much stronger here. The faculty mm. has an organisation mm. than it is at Oxford, where people only went to faculty meetings in, in order to vote down change. You know, <laughs> if, if there's any development in the, mm. in the curriculum. Otherwise, sort of in terms of tone or culture, what, what, how would you characterise the? The colleges are smaller, as you said. Um, in, so in Oxford, mm, yes. Mm. Well, they are. and But, of course, I was at a very distinctive college anyway, mm. Nuffield. I mean, it wasn't an mm. orthodox college. But they are. They're bigger here. They're more relaxed. Uh, uh, the other thing for me, as it would be for anybody uh, coming from Nuffield, was the variety, the, the um, academic variety of the fellowship. Mm. You know, mm. I met scientists and mm. with them. Uh, and it was also a bit like coming home, mm. back to, to mm. Christ, where I'd been mm. as, an, as a graduate student. To be there, so the collegiate life was I found rather attractive, and they mm. gave me a nice set of room, a nice room, mm. where I was able to work mm. adequately, which didn't happen to everybody. It was a bit mm. of patronage mm. by Jack Plum. Mm. I mean, not every professor got a room. I, mm. I turned a blind eye to this distinction, <laughs> uh, and that was that was nice. And I met very congenial colleagues like mm. David Canadine and, mm. uh, and Quentin again. Mm. I mean, I'd known Quentin mm. before. Quentin was instrumental in persuading me to put him for the chair. Um, so that was very good, and mm. so there was a much more, a much warmer, more sympathetic, more intellectually uh, redolent mm. atmosphere in in Christ mm. than there had been in Nuffield, although Nuffield was for mm. another reason quite interesting. Um, and also, I was able to feel my because I was the, uh, a professor, but in any case, because of the organisation in Cambridge, able to feel myself much more part of the university mm. structure of my field. Mm. then it was at Oxford, where, as I said, the faculty mm. hardly uh, mm. existed. Um, but here, faculty meetings are important. And also, I was a member of the economics faculty because mm. of the, the chair is mm. uh, ex officio member. So that was interesting or a bit mm. fraught because it was still in the, the tail end of this mm. Trotskyite Marxist thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but met all sorts of interesting people mm. and, and got to know Robin Matthews better mm. as well. We, we uh, collaborated on an mm. article on Marshall in mm. the centenary. You mentioned um, that one advantage of NAFIA was there were no undergraduates. Do you actually enjoy teaching, lecturing or supervising? I, I enjoyed supervising. I didn't much enjoy lecturing because I don't think I'm a very good lecturer. Uh, and therefore the audiences weren't as uh, uh, numerous or ebullient as I wanted. I always mm. used I do frankly remember being here and, and hopefully waiting the extra few minutes in case an extra three or four people would come mm. in. I mean, people mm. attended, but 
it wasn't like Quentin mm. Skinner or mm. Jeffrey Elton. Mm. Uh, so I sort of in, in, I enjoyed the intellectual challenge of compiling a lecture, mm. a, a lecture, and in a sense giving it. But I preferred the supervision and the one, mm. the, the person personal contact and the ability to get one's teeth into a, into an essay and, and mm. talk about it. Yeah. Mm. But I didn't do much of that here because, mm. in fact, I didn't teach a lot. I mean, I gave my lectures and uh, did some supervision of graduate theses, but mm. I didn't do any undergraduate, of uh, undergraduate theses, mm. I didn't do any undergraduate normal supervision mm. here, whereas I did in Oxford. Mm. Uh, did you do any, uh, have you done much PhD supervising? Not as much as I had mm. wanted, I think partly because of the, my distinctive, you know, mm. what I was doing. But I have, I have done, mm. yeah, some, yeah. Mm. And uh, uh, some some of the, oddly enough, some of the uh, uh, thesis examining has mm. been with more interesting people than those mm. I was supervising. Mm. Um, uh, a man called Paul Johnson, who mm. was who worked on savings banks and thrift and everything, he's now in Australia, but he was mm. an LSE, as an mm. example of that. And David Feldman, who, oh, yes. who went to Birkbeck, mm. whose thesis I examined, mm. and things mm. like that. Yeah. So I came, I didn't have as much contact with, uh, continuously, with, with uh, research students as I would have liked. Mm. Well, we've got about 10 minutes, so we've got two major things that are on my agenda. One is um, mastership of some cats, um, and then the Levy Hume, and there'll probably be one or two other things, but let's, let, let's move perhaps to mm. some Catherine's. Yeah. Um, why did you do that, and uh, did you? Are you glad you did that? Oh, I'm very. I'm glad I did it, and I did it. I suppose because of the desire for esteem, I mean, mm. feeling of authority, and and the sense that it wasn't a purely administrative. It wasn't an administrative job that would preoccupy me. It was mm. something I could probably do while remaining, intellectually speaking, mm. an academic, scholarly speaking, mm. an academic. And it's you know, it's the, it's the top of the pole mm. or whatever. Mm. It's, it's, rather good to be. I had also had um, uh, an unsuccessful bid at the Christ mm. Mastership when uh, Jack retired and that was a very uh, fraught and peculiar uh, business which I... Any more so than all those <laughs> previous ones documented so famously? Uh, <laughs> only because there were more people involved it was messier. <laughs> I mean in the, the Masters as mm, you know it only yes. had whatever it is mm. half a dozen electors or 13 mm. or something yeah, yeah. Uh, but this, this had 30 or 40 electors mm. so it was a problem of circulation and there was a bit of fancy footwork that mm. I didn't much admire <laughs> uh, and, but that, that's alright. Uh, uh, because they, they did elect, before I was a candidate, they elected, um, now I've forgotten his name, He's, mm. he was the British ambassador first in Germany and then to America, mm. um, Wright, Oliver Wright, mm. and he was elected, but then the, the Falcons War broke out mm. and Mrs Thatcher wafted him off mm. to America and so he withdrew mm. and there was another election. Mm. And uh, my opponent in the election, Hans mm. Kornberg, uh, not not unnice man, <laughs> his his supporters, let us say, circulated a note immediately before there was any other candidate asking people to commit themselves to him, <laughs> which enough did to sew up the election. Mm -hmm. to, in the event to sew up mm. the election, it was mm. still a a, a a contest, and mm. I was I was run, but not mm. very successful. Well, almost successfully, but not quite. <laughs> anyway, so I failed at that, and then mm. within two or three months. Uh, the St Catherine's thing mm. came up and I was very happy to put in for it. I knew one or two people there, John mm. Thompson and uh, Christopher Bailey and, mm. and I, I knew of it mm. quite well so I was happy to do that and uh, enjoyed it Enjoyed it, and, and also enjoyed discovering a new level of life, I mean, mm. a, new, a new authority I suppose, a new type of authority. Mm. Really. Mm. Yeah. Did your wife enjoy it? She did in the event uh, I say in the event because the, in the middle of the Christ election, which I'd rather mm. gone in for without much consultation inside the family, she confessed that she had once stood outside in the rain the gates of the Master's Lodge and looked in and wondered what the future might hold for her. Mm. And I realised then that this had been a very unfair way of proceeding, that mm. she was tagging along. Whereas in the St Catherine's case there was a lot of consultation and she thoroughly enjoyed the... I mean, mm. we went out of her way to, to mm. make it a, a, a proper lodge and she mm. entertained people. And we devised things like when there was a... 
when there was the, the annual ransom dinner, she would invite all the wives mm. to come and meet in the lodge and throw it open things, and we entertained students. Yeah, she liked that very much. Mm. Mm. Uh, and and that from that viewpoint was very successful. I think people sometimes remember her more fondly than they remember me. <laughs> has she played any part? I mean, she obviously has, but any di- very direct part in your academic life? I mean, uh, did she read your? She did. Uh, she died. Uh, wife, the wife I'm referring to, mm. died in two thousand and two. Uh, she did. She she. Uh, I discussed a lot of things with her, and she actually helped me as a research. Uh, uh, a system for a bit in, in looking at journals and stuff yeah. when I was working yeah. on policy and she actually worked a little bit for uh, paid work for Max Hartwell um, yeah. on his legal social legal work uh, so she, yes she was a great help meet from that viewpoint mm. Mm. and and uh, sympathetic and uh, you know, we, we were close as husband yeah. and wife can be and so yeah. I talked a lot with her yeah. about the issues that arise and particularly once I was master of a college where the nature of one's work is, is yeah. uh, and she was very patient in when I made yet another change in 1993 and left it and went to mm. work for Leverhulme. Mm. And it was very tolerant of my toing and froing on America. Mm. The number of times I toyed with it almost moved mm. her, moved mm. her along. Mm. Well, that takes us to to the last phase, which is um, uh, well, not the last phase, but another phase, um, Leverhulme. Yes. Um, how did that happen? And well, phys- I mean. Uh, empirically it happened mm. with a phone call from a from a headhunter mm. a recruitment firm saying they were looking for the director and giving me a few names to mm. uh, to ask my opinion on but although I can be foolish I wasn't foolish enough to think they were doing that purely <laughs> <laughs> uh, and at the end of the conversation he said would I like to be considered and I mm. paused for the necessary half second and said yes well my feeling was that and it happened in the other sense mm. in which you're asking in that I'd been however long that was, 40 odd years in academic life. I'd been a professor, I'd been an administrator, I'd been chair, and I'd always thought that the head of a fairly wealthy academic foundation was a very attractive thing because it didn't have some, some, of, the, some of the disadvantages, the obligations, the need to carry people along with you, the, the need to, to uh, argue about policy a lot, uh, that could happen in a college. Although I was very happy with doing that, I wanted that degree of change. It seemed to me to offer scope for academic contribution, if not direct, but helping other people, and autonomy that didn't necessarily exist in universities. So I was, and I always thought that Leverhulme was one, and uh, my wife reminded me at that point that I'd got a scholarship from Leverhulme. I'd forgotten <laughs> when I was an undergraduate. Yes. Mm. Uh, and uh, and also Charles Wilson had written the history of Unilever and mm. Leaving Humans an offshoot of Unilever. In fact, later on I was asked if I wanted to write the fourth volume mm. because they needed to complete mm. it. Uh, I didn't. But, uh, so that was attractive, yeah. Mm. And I went in 1993. And it was good? It was very good, yeah. Mm. It was as I thought. It was a well-endowed foundation with some very liberal businessmen and trustees willing to both to encourage um, academic research and also to be receptive to new ideas for mm. types of programs. Um, I soon discovered how pleasant people could be to you if you were head of a research institute. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't generate any enemies, as far as I know. Uh, and it gave me an opportunity, of, I travelled a lot around initially just to mm. see different universities where we are. Mm. And it wasn't it was busy but not demanding you know. and I felt very interested both in the variety and the depth of the things I was doing and got on very well with the, they were all Unilever uh, uh, board members, that's the nature of the trust, mm. so I got on very well with them and uh, they were very understanding of academic life, I mean contrary to what some of my colleagues predicted, I mm. mean they thought the business firm would mm. be reactionary and, and mm. illiberal. And, uh, and they were a bit reactionary, but they weren't illiberal. I mean, <laughs> so, yeah. mm. so that was that was. Um, uh, went away. I went up in ninety three. That was seven, uh, eight years, very happy years. Mm. Uh, but it had to end because the other thing is, of course, it gave me an, uh, an extended lease of operations mm. because uh, I went there when I was sixty two, mm. and it could be for another as it turned out, seven or eight years. So I'd go beyond mm. what would have been the age of mm. retirement had I stayed. 
and that was uh, was very satisfying. Yeah, mm. it did. It was an upheaval because I had to get a flat in London. I mean, mm. I mean for mm. Pierre de Terre, yeah. uh, stayed in Cambridge as the main mm. house, so I travelled up and down on a weekly mm. basis. Yeah. Would you put it on expenses? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, not the travel, but the pay was very munificent. <laughs> I can't uh, complain. This is just an illusion. Those watching it to the MPs' expenses. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, se- yeah, Second homes. Well, the second home was provided. It's all right. Uh, the second home was a was a tied cottage. Uh, I mean, they, I didn't. Unless, I mean, I'd have been much better off had I bought it mm. because the capital appreciation <laughs> was huge. It was in mm. the Barbican, but they bought me a flat and I lived mm. in it. And then when I left, I left it. You know, mm. So. Well, there's so many other things, but um, if I can do a plug for you, your autobiography titled... Uh, Doors Open. Doors Open is available on all, in all good bookshops and certainly on... Well, it isn't thing. really, because it was privately published, <laughs> well, and I'm the, yes, I'm yeah. the uh, originator, I'm but, the origin uh, of it, yeah, at, yeah. There it is on Amazon, at least, and uh, mm-hmm. I'm very much looking forward to reading it. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Not at all, thank you. Glad to have uh, participated.